Today we celebrated the sacrament of baptism using water to symbolize not only the washing away of sin, but the marking of little Caden as one of God's own children. It's interesting that we use water for this purpose. Water is so common and simple, yet it's one of the most versatile and amazing substances in the known universe. And it's quite refreshing. About 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water, and it literally falls from the sky. Yet it is extremely rare. We know of no other planet besides our own that features liquid on its liquid water on its surface. Water is necessary for life. The human body is made up of about 60% water. Though the average person could live up to a month or longer without food, that same person would last only a few days without drinking water. Because of surface tension, water will beat up because of or, and, and form a, a skin that will actually bear weight. Because of capillary action, water molecules will stick together and move up through roots and stems and leaves, making vegetation growth possible. Water is one of the few substances that becomes less dense when it freezes. That's why ice cubes float and why lakes and rivers freeze from the top down. In middle school, we learned that water is the universal solvent because given enough time, water will dissolve just about anything. Actually, it will dissolve everything, excuse me. Evidence of this can be seen in the Grand Canyon where over the course of millions of years, the Colorado River has eroded the land so as to carve one of the great wonders of the natural world. Likewise, the freezing and thawing cycle of water can reduce great mountains to fine soil. And the steady drip of water depositing minerals over centuries has created magnificent stalagmite and stalactite formations in places like Carlsbad Caverns. Water can float great ships, it can shape landforms, and it can dissolve metal, yet it is safe enough to drink and gentle enough for you to wash a baby or to play in on a hot summer day. In the Bible, water has great symbolic significance. In the very beginning, the Spirit of God moves over the face of the waters. And at the end, in Revelation, the river of life flows by the throne of God. In between, the Israelites pass through the waters of the Red Sea and the Jordan River on their way into the Promised Land. Moses brings forth water from the rock. Naaman is healed in the waters of the Jordan River, and Jesus is baptized in those same waters. Peter shows faith and then a lack of faith by trying to walk out to Jesus on the water, and the woman at the well is promised by Jesus living water. So perhaps it's appropriate that as a sign of God's cleansing of our sin and making us new, we use water, the universal solvent. And it's also appropriate that as a sign of God's claim on us, we use water without which there could be no life. In our New Testament passage today, we see that the celebrations of Jesus' birth have passed. Jesus has grown up from the child visited by shepherds and magi. He is now an adult who responds to John's call to repent and be baptized in the River Jordan. John the Baptist is actually calling all of Israel to repent and turn away from sin and turn back to God. Those acts of repentance are dramatized by ritual washing in the river. The washing is not integral to the process, mind you, but by using water in this way, John's message is intensified and made more meaningful to those who hear and join in. But a question that's always plagued theologians and maybe is on the minds of some of you right now is why would the sinless Son of God need to participate in John's baptism of repentance? Since Jesus is sinless, why would he feel the need to be renewed and made clean? Scholars have wrestled with that through the years. Some have offered a number of interesting explanations. One scholar speaks of systems of evil that are sinful and which we all, even Jesus, unavoidably take part a modern example of that might be unknowingly buying clothing from a store that uses sweatshop labor in a third world country. Another scholar speaks of Jesus' solidarity with the rest of humanity. Jesus did not need to be baptized, but did so as an example to and to show support for others who did. William Barclay, though, argues that what John was doing in the wilderness 
was an exciting thing that was getting people fired up for renewal. John was teaching that Israel, God's chosen people, were stained with sin and needed to be washed and changed. Jesus would have been swept up in this excitement along with everyone else. Barclay writes that throughout the whole country, there was an unprecedented movement towards God. It was not that Jesus was conscious of sin and of the need of repentance. It was that he knew that his time had come and that he too must identify with this movement towards God. I tend to think that Barclay is at least partly right here, and I ask you to consider two things. One, Christians, as Christians, we have had 2,000 plus years of historical perspective through which to recognize Jesus as the sinless Son of God. But as Luke tells it, it's not until after the baptism that the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus and we hear the words of God proclaiming, this is my son, the beloved, with him I am well pleased. So it is entirely fair to speculate that up until that moment, Jesus may not have realized the full extent and significance of who he was. Until that point, he may not have understood himself to be worthy of skipping the baptism line. And second, later on in Luke's gospel, we hear Jesus teach his disciples not to take the first seat at a banquet because it's better to take the lowest seat and have the host invite you up than to take the highest seat and be presumptuous and have the host ask you to slide down and make room for someone more important. It is reasonable then with that in mind to imagine that this humble Jesus would have gone to the river to repent and to be baptized even if he did not need it because doing so was a humble and faithful way to honor God. But in the final analysis, I like to think that Jesus went to repent and be baptized simply because, as a person of deep faith, it never occurred to him not to. As Jesus is baptized, the waters of the Jordan symbolize his being made clean, his renewal as a person committed to God, like the hundreds or even thousands of others who are gathered there with him. Likewise, in our own baptisms, water is significant because it symbolizes washing and being made clean, and, and it serves to mark us as God's own children. But the water we use does not actually convey God's grace. The water is not particularly more holy than any other water. You can't use it to repel vampires. It doesn't actually change us. Jim Richardson is a retired Presbyterian minister that I worked with for several years, and he once told me a story about water and what it does to us in baptism. He said a Protestant moved into a completely Catholic community. Being good Catholics, he said, they welcomed him to the neighborhood, but also they were good Catholics, so they did not eat red meat on Fridays. So when their neighbor began grilling out steaks every Friday night, the smell would drive them crazy. They were so troubled that they went to talk to him about it, and after much talk and conversation, they convinced him to become Catholic. The next Sunday, he went to the priest, and the priest sprinkled holy water on him and said, you were born a Protestant, you were raised a Protestant, now you're a Catholic. And so the next Friday, thinking their problem had been solved, the Catholics of the neighborhood sat down to eat their fish and were once again disturbed by the smell of grilling snake, steak, wafting over from the neighboring yard. So they went over to talk to their new Catholic neighbor because he knew he was not supposed to eat steak on Fridays. And when they saw him, he, they saw him sprinkling water on his steaks saying, you were born a cow, you were raised a cow, now you are a fish. Water can do amazing things but water alone cannot change the nature of who we are. Only God can do that. In the Reformed tradition of which we Presbyterians are a part, we consider baptism to be an outward sign of an inward act. Our Book of Order says that baptism is the sign and symbol of inclusion in God's grace and in God's covenant with the church. In some traditions, baptism is something that the believer must claim for him or herself. Only if someone makes a decision to claim God and be baptized can the sacrament be effective. But in our tradition, we profess that it is God's act that precedes our own. 
That is why we baptize infants and children. Because even before we can lay claim to God, God has laid claim to us. There's a great little book called Being Presbyterian in the Bible Belt. You may not consider yourselves to be in the Bible Belt, but it's still a neat little book about Presbyterian beliefs. I commend it to you. The authors of that book put it this way. They say, this is one reason why Presbyterian types do not link salvation to baptism. A person's salvation is not dependent upon one's baptism. The sacrament is the sign and symbol of being claimed and included by God. Neither the ritual nor the experience of baptism either creates salvation or bestows it. When I run a bath for my boys, they always like to spend a little extra time floating in the warm water of the tub, especially on cold nights. It's relaxing and it's comforting to feel the warmth of the water surrounding you. Similarly, in the waters of baptism, we find great comfort and reassurance of God's magnificent grace and mercy and steadfast love. But the waters of the baptismal font also serve to mark us as God's own. In the waters of baptism, we find our identity as children of God. We are all created different, made in a wide variety of colors and sizes and shapes and abilities, and our society tends to heighten the awareness of our differences and exacerbate the things that divide us, but we share all of us, that one indelible mark, the mark of God made by the splashing waters of baptism. By this mark, we are included in God's family, made one with all who share the sign and symbol of baptism, included with those who have gone before and those who will come after in the body of Christ, the church. In one of his books, William Barclay relates the story of several soldiers in World War II France who brought the body of a dead comrade to a church cemetery to have him buried. He writes, The priest told them gently that he was bound to ask if their comrade had been baptized in the tradition of that church. They said they did not know. The priest said that he was very sorry, but in this case he could not permit burial in his churchyard. So the soldiers took their comrade and sadly buried him just outside the fence. When the war was over, the soldiers came back to visit the grave of their friend. They found the church in that little town and they remembered the location of the grave just outside the fence. And they began to search for it, but they could not find it anywhere. So finally they went to the priest and they asked him about its location. Well, the priest said, after you buried your friend, it just didn't seem right to me that he should be buried there outside the fence. So you moved the grave, asked one of the soldiers. No, said the priest, I moved the fence. Though the world divide us, and though we find our identity too often in the company of those who we consider to be most like us, God throws wide the gates of the kingdom and claims us all as children of God. In baptism, we find our true identities indelibly linked to God's eternal claim on each of us, embodied in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus the Christ, and enacted and sealed in the waters of baptism. It is truly a mark of the holy that in something so simple as water, we find symbolized something so profound that in something so common as water, we experience a grace, mercy, and steadfast love that is most uncommon. To God be all grace, honor, power, and glory in this world and the world to come. Amen.